the job creation has been anemic. And do you have some ideas that might help us turn the situation around? You know, I, I believe that it's the job of the government to you know make it so that they there's a good foundation, a good environment for job creation. You know, I'm not going to start sending money to this industry or that company. Um, you know, really, I think getting a lot of the federal regulations down to the states um, would be one of the answers. I mean, the idea that uh, you know a, a business in Massachusetts is the same should be regulated the same as in Colorado or Michigan or Florida. I mean. The, the overreach of the federal government um, and the power that they have. And, and really, when there are problems, they can't go to, I mean, going to Washington, I would prefer them to go to Lansing if they have problems. So I really, it's, you know, I think a lot of what I'm going to Washington to help with job creation would be to get the regulations at, down to the state level and out of the, out of the federal as much as we can. I mean, uh, there may be some areas where uh, you know they're producing medicines that uh, go across state lines, and you know there's some there's certainly some role, but it needs to be uh, a lot less. Um, you know the tax policy, the ten thousand pages uh, or more of the IRS as a CPA. I know businesses. You know, a lot of it's large because a lot of it is carve outs. A lot of it is lobbyists that got their carve out for their company. I mean, we need just a flat, very fair, and honest tax. I think something that is predictable. Obamacare, eliminating that. Job, business job creators need predictability and they need to, uh, they need freedom. And quite frankly, the federal government in these areas uh, like Obamacare and, uh, and the regulations uh, really, really struggle and really cause problems for these businesses. I understand of the 280,000 new jobs we got this last month, 270 of them were part time. And I think, isn't that largely due to the Obamacare? Yeah. I've, I've got a friend in business who um, says that he's going to have to put all of his people on part time because he cannot afford to provide that health care. He doesn't provide it now, and he'd have to fire him or right. go part time. Right. So. Yeah, no, I mean, that's, you know, they, they call it unintended consequences. This is what happens when you centralize, when you have centralized planning. Um, the, you know, they say, oops, now we got to fix that. And that fix will be, have all kinds of unintended consequences. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's, this is what you get when you have a government that, when you have con people in Congress and in the bureaucracy that think that they're, you know, they're all wise and they can figure these problems out. We just need to get power out. We, you know, that's not, the solution is not more government. The solution is less government. I certainly agree. I think uh, one of the, the government ought to be facilitating job growth, not providing it. And I think, frankly, what a, I think it's not an unintended consequence. I think it's an intended consequence. Mm -hmm. Because Obama's trying to get as many people dependent on the government as possible. And that every, you look at everything he's done, it's that. And all the job growth, when they make jobs, they're government employees. And you, you've heard that. Now Washington has got something, the Washington metropolitan area has got seven of the, the 10 richest cities in the country right. now because of all that administrative Lobby. hierarchy, they're all right. paid big bucks. Uh, all the politicians that every these fostered collecting there. You know, there's just, just... got to get the government out of the business area and the businesses, the marketplace will fix the, the job growth. Problem. And you know, there's just there's not a lot of uh, congressmen who will actually. They, once you get there, I believe there's you fold into the Washington way, and you don't rock the boat. You kind of you know make it look like you're going to balance the budget in ten years. You're going to look like you're made, you're dealing with an issue. But yeah, I really think that uh, it takes somebody who's been bold in, in some of the areas that I've done who will actually. And I'll be one of four thirty five. I don't have any you know pre preconceived notions or you know, ideas that I'm going to solve everything, but. There's a growing group, uh, you know, that I think are, are really serious about addressing the debt and deficit and addressing the overreach of the federal government. And it does require connecting and making sure you go around the mainstream media and you get to the voters. And that's something that, that I enjoy doing and will continue to do. Yeah. Can you clarify proposal one? Is that <laughs> yeah. yeah, somebody else asked you that. This is yeah. not a, again, not a federal question, but I certainly don't mind uh, answering it. Um, the reason, you know, I 
the reason I'm supporting it is because under Granholm and uh, my opponent, they they passed a lot of uh, subsidies, writing checks to companies um, for so-called jobs. Or you know, I mean, this, there's a lot of corporate welfare, billions of dollars that are going to be that have been given out that will start rolling off. And so we're going to these uh, come to an end, and Lansing is going to have more money. And they've timed this, and the, one of the reasons it's, it's kind of difficult to read. Uh, they've timed it so that as those tax credits and those subsidies roll off, that Lansing doesn't get the money. It's going to go straight down to the locals, and the locals are not going to be able to tax the personal property, the, the desks and the chairs and the, everything that they're currently uh, having to pay taxes on. And so as they lose that revenue at the local level, it's going to be backfilled by that additional money that's going to start coming in as these, these uh, corporate welfare starts rolling off. The, the alternative, if it fails, is that that money is going to go to Lansing. And I just want to cross Lansing to uh, send it, you know, to cut taxes. They're going to find ways to spend it. Um, and, and so I would prefer that Lansing not get that money, and that it go down you know, to the locals and, and reimburse them for the lost revenue that they're going to, that they're going to incur by cutting the personal property tax. So it's a little bit, uh, you know, it's... It, <laughs> there's there's some other <laughs> so about 14 more yeah I'm sorry <clears throat> it's clear as mud yeah no, I mean it's I mean what's that's, it that's... with use tax what's that what does it have to do with use tax well that's the vehicle they're going to use to you know to make sure that it's paid uh, but I mean the money you know the money that would be going to Lansing as these uh, subsidies and tax credits roll off would be going into the general fund and be used. Uh, you know, they, I think it would be spent. So they're they're going to end up. You know, that's that's why it's staggered over years as they uh, as those tax credits roll off. That's when these uh, the personal property tax. Yeah, who, who authorized this? I mean, who the author of this? It came out of tax policy. I, Which one? Republican, Democrat? The House and Senate under the Republican. Because I'll tell you, this is something I expect to come out of the White House. It's, well, it's a tax cut. I mean, you know, it's, a... it's not a tax cut. You know, what that use tax has to do with all this, and how is eliminating the use tax going to help create jobs? I'm just, it's going to make our businesses be able to you know, have additional resources to hire people. Um, you know, they, they spend money hiring CPAs like me to fill out these property tax. Uh, personal property tax forms to pay for desks and tables. Uh, it's a real burden on on job providers, and it's going to be something that'll be taken away from job providers. So, again, I don't want to get too much into the state okay. issues. I'm running for federal. Well, office. you're as clear as much tonight too. <laughs> approval or disapproval of a mandatory act to reduce state use tax and replace with the local community stabilization share to modernize the tax system to help small businesses grow and create jobs. Now, any of all the stuff you've been saying, where is that ever covered in this? I mean, I'm giving it. I'm, I'm letting you know how it's you know, how it's going to work, and, that, and what's what's behind it, how they're funding it, and how they're making sure the locals, you know, locals are supportive of it because uh, you know it, it will well, reimburse they, them. What they do not like the tax that they're losing from the state. They're, they won't be losing tax from the state. They'll be getting it. They're going to be losing it from getting it from business. They won't be taxed. Job providers. So, taxed. Yeah. So the job providers will have, won't be taxed on things that they're taxed on. And, uh, <laughs> like desks and tables and chairs and uh, personal property. That's personal property. Doesn't have anything to do with sales and use tax. What is the sales and use tax component of this? That's the that's the vehicle they're they that's the revenues they're using to reimburse the, uh, the locals. I mean they can't they can't say as uh, Dow's you know tax credit rolls off it's going to go to Birmingham or to Rochester. That's not what they would be able to do. This is the this is the legislative uh, way to make sure that this is going. You got my notebook. Yes. Expiration. Okay. Why aren't the illegals? Uh, being allowed in this country. Why are they not being just 
what's your position? What do you think? Well, I mean, we really, like I said, we need to secure the borders. We don't, they, they shouldn't be coming into our country. Uh, you know, and, and by the way, they're coming in, and Mexico has a hand in this. They're not stopping them either. Yeah. Um, you know, they're coming yeah. through. So, you know, there really needs to be, you know, the countries that are allowing this to happen, there needs to be accountability for that. And we certainly need to look at any kind of uh, foreign aid that we're giving to countries that are assisting uh, okay. in, you know, in this uh, basically invasion uh, that's going Why on. Why is uh, the United States always the one that has to solve all these supposed problems? You know, the savior of the world kind of thing. Why are not the United Nations? Those countries where these people are coming from, if they're so horrendous down there, why is not like the United Nations down there? Why? Well, because they're trying to get American money to spread around to the rest of the world. Oh, well, yeah, just everybody come and we have to solve all the problems. Go through the U.S. Well, it's, it's just a Pandora's box that's been open. With the transparency, um, you are very helpful with the Homeowners Association to try to get them to show us um, data. We did finally see it, but we never got a copy of it. So when you're talking about taking that to the federal government, are you saying you're going to roll model like you did here and, and do things yourself, or are you going to spread it to make it easier? If we have an issue as a citizen that we can get information from the federal government. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say... I mean, maybe this will help answer it. This morning, I was up in Oxford. There's a uh, FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. There, there's a gentleman that I became a Facebook friend after I read and posted an article that uh, they're looking at a pipeline uh, and where the pipeline goes uh, and, you know, it would destroy a lot of his plans and, and property. And, you know, I was there with the FERC uh, regulators talking to them and, and I kept asking, you know, what? How does, who, how does somebody like Bruce go up against FERC and you know, the the federal government and the bureaucracy? And they said, well, the courts. <laughs> and I thought, you know, and so that she was explaining that, well, you know, this pipeline that they're talking about it, um, and you know, if, if they get a certificate from FERC, then they'll be able to you know, go forward, and then uh, you know, there there might be uh, problems with landowners, and then they take it to court. I said, well, how do you who decides the certificate? And she said, well, there's some, you know, there's some comments, period. But I said, who's, is there an ombudsman? I mean, Bruce here doesn't know the system. I mean, the bureaucracy is a behemoth. And there, you know, there isn't somebody that, you know, I got the distinct uh, impression that there's nobody to really help citizens that feel that they're being wronged by FERC or by a federal agency. Um, now, I don't know, you know, I've, you create an ombudsman everywhere. Uh, I don't know. The system shouldn't be so difficult to where it has. It requires, you know, people to necessarily help you out. But I, I really do. Yeah. To, to answer your question, I believe citizens should be able to challenge city hall or the federal government without it just being this this nebulous, you know, bureaucracy. Um, and so that's as a legislator, I would do that for my. You know, my my uh, the citizens that I represent and help them. But yeah, you're right. Ultimately, there needs to be procedures so that it's more transparent, it's more simple, it's clear. Um, and, you know, you do that through forcing transparency. Um, and so, yeah, the things that I've done to try and help homeowners in the area at, at the state level, I certainly would do that. But there does need to be, it shouldn't be relying on what you're, you know, just on, you have a good congressman or not, really need the systemic change so that it's not, uh, it's not, and a lot of that has to do with just getting the power down to the, to the state level, getting out of it, and, and making sure that you have a lot better chance of uh, fighting Lansing than you do Washington in that direction. And that, that would be where I, I think that, that would be my, my focus, would be to push that while I'm helping our citizens in these areas. Pushing a lot of the power down closer to the people. Really yeah. Any Republicans who have questions? You don't let you don't let Democrats <laughs> ask questions. <laughs> I thought you were transparent, Tom. You, you're all about transparency. Yeah, yeah, okay, so you a couple back Are you to thinking about voting in the Republican primary. 
I don't think that's relevant. I don't have to tell you how I'm going to vote. This is America. I have a freedom to vote however yeah, I want. That's who you're voting for. Yes. I, don't, I, I don't think it's relevant, Tom, who I'm voting for. You're, you're going to be representing me. If you were to be elected to the U.S. Congress, you would be representing me, Tom. I, I don't have to answer that question. You, okay, so can I answer my question now? Okay, so you seem to, impl you didn't imply, you said straight out that uh, President Obama is involved in some kind of conspiracy in bringing in, in the uh, children, the uh, refugee children that are uh, coming in. I, I didn't you did, I have, it on, I have it on my video, we can play it back. So I, wanna, I want you, first of all, to explain what the, how, how President Obama is involved in the conspiracy. So I would like you to flesh that out for us for everybody here, how he's involved in that conspiracy. And number two, yeah. the children, the ch these are, these are un unaccompanied minors that are coming to our country from, all of them, from countries where they're, can I ask, the, can I ask him a question, please? Can I please ask my question? Stop interrupting me. Thank you. I didn't, okay, these are unaccompanied minors that are coming from countries where their lives are literally at risk. So would, my question is, on that issue, would you, would, would you send them back, and how much would you uh, allocate to accompany, accompli accomplish sending them back to their home countries? I think we need to understand why they're here, how they got here, what their, uh, what's their... I don't think you have 30,000 or however many kids show up just a uh, very short period of time just uh, by happening. So I think we need to understand what happened. Uh, but I want this to be instructive to the Republicans. This is the kind of thing that, and, and really, when you get uh, people in Congress, they, they shrink when there's people like this. You know, they're bullies. They, they I'm not bullying you, Tom. I'm asking a legitimate they're, question. I'm, I'm talking. They're, they're, You're they're, saying something about me that isn't true. They use Alinsky's type tactics to, you know, really try to, to intimidate, and they don't, they don't really want people to be out there engaged. They want uh, legislators to hide and to, you know, shrink from this stuff. So I'm somebody who doesn't, this doesn't bother me. They, you still haven't answered they, my question. And they come and they, they harass the, the people who are actually affected. The people, you know, Republicans that actually are kind of go along, get along, they get passed uh, a lot of times. But it's the, it's the ones who are really affected that they really get upset at. And, and then these kind of tactics and others that they use oftentimes intimidate. And, you, you know, you end up having legislators that will you know, not be as bold as but you know, I'm, I'm somebody who has taken this this kind of thing and will continue to fight hard for conservatives to really not keep expanding the government. Sort of push me out of Washington. That's a great speech, Tom. But you didn't answer either one of my questions. I, I did. No, you didn't. Yes, I, I think we should be more compassionate for this gentleman because liberalism is a male illness. <laughs> <laughs> You're really funny. Yes, sir. Uh, talk of a conspiracy, that's a conspiracy by our president to destroy our constitutional republic. He has no interest in following the Constitution. And those that take the oath of office are to defend and support the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. He certainly is an enemy of this country because he's destroying it. This man is an evil, evil, evil individual. Two years from now, we, two and a half years we have him. The way we're being destroyed right now, we're going to approach a Soviet-style police state, and everybody that has any brains is going to realize. Pardon me for being so snotty. Pardon me for being brains. snotty, but it's true. He has two more years. How is he going to be stopped? No, oh, Boehner has no interest in impeachment, and a practical reason is because you're not going to get 67 senators to convict. Right. The problem is, I have read Richard Nixon's uh, articles of impeachment. Of course, he quit before he was impeached. And what Obama's done makes him look like a kindergarten play. It's amazing. Boehner, I think Boehner is totally frightened by Obama. I don't know if Obama has something on him. But I, they should have not just had a select committee on the Benghazi. The big one is the uh, IRS, which is right. Article 2 right. of Nixon's impeachment. By not letting those groups get stuff out, probably 4 million Republicans did not vote conservative, and it might, we might have had a different president. Not that I love Romney, but he sort of would have been a hell of a lot better than Obama. Yes. Obama's out to destroy yes. this country. I wish when Congress people get on TV, Fox, CNN, 
MSNBC, they would say, this is not a progressive or a liberal. Okay. He's a dictator. He's a Marxist dictator that wants to destroy and turn us into a third world country. And those, I study this crap interminably. Maybe it's turning my mind crazy. I don't know. But what I do know is what's happening in this country, and I wish people would admit what truly happened. We're going to... I didn't expect that. <laughs> well, let me, let me answer I'm your just, question. Uh, I, you know, legislators, a uh, their power is in the purse. And in the power is the purse. That's right. I think resolutions, you know, the, the Democrats don't pass budgets. And then, you know, Remember, you can't stop Obamacare until there's another president. Unless Congress goes ahead and violates the law. Because but, as, when he but, made all those changes, putting Obamacare from 14 to 15, that means probably 10 million people. I'm glad it didn't happen for their sake. But 10 or 20 million people would have lost their jobs, would have lost that, would have turned into halftime and everything else, at which the Senate would definitely turn Republican. I don't know if there's going to be enough to get rid of that asshole Harry Reid. Pardon my language. Well, uh, I'm a laid say, back guy, but I'm, I, I, I care about my wife. I care about my children and grandchildren. I, I lived during Hitler's time, and if we don't watch out, because I'm 81 years old, if we don't watch out, we're going to turn into Obama will be more responsible for murdering people in this country than Hitler and uh, Stalin combined. Oh, let me say this. If there was a continuing resolution uh, issue coming up next week, or a debt ceiling issue coming up next week, and then there was a Vote. We would that would be the immigration issue, uh, the IRS issue. You know, these would be on the table uh, because that that's the leverage that I believe legislators have. And so, if you say IRS, you're going to get you know you're going to get your you're gonna get half of your appropriation if you don't produce those emails. Um, you know, maybe the emails would would uh, all of a sudden appear. But you know, I mean, that is where. I've used the budgetary process effectively, and I think that's where the power uh, that you would be able to hold me accountable. I would say we're going to go in and deal with some of these executive orders. Uh, we feel they're wrong, and, and it's in the budget that you can deal with. Them. And you know, you can deal with probably a lot of Obamacare in the budget. Um, and so that would be that's the power. Uh, you know, bills and writing legislation. You get a lot of legislators who will just write bills, but you know, they don't come out of committee. They don't get over to the other chamber. They don't get from that chamber to the president, and you don't think you know, that the president's actually going to say anything. So the power is in is in the. Uh, One big problem is Republicans are afraid of being called racist. The voter gets on and puts that just because we're against his communistic and fascist principles, we're blood was called racist because we're against him. I mean that that's crazy, and, and it works. He's on TV five or six times a day. Bush might have been on thirty times a year. I mean, it's a, just, uh, I, mean, I, didn't, yeah. I don't know. I, I should just shut up. On vacation. <laughs> well, we got time for one more question. If there's anybody that uh, has any, I'll be sticking around, uh, certainly. Um, but uh, I, I appreciate I appreciate you coming out. Again, I, I really do believe that uh, we have an opportunity to send somebody. I'm not going there to just fold into the Washington. You know, the Washington. I'm going there, uh, and my, I think my the history and to really deal with uh, and make sure that, you know, unlike my opponent, I voted against uh, raising the uh, debt for uh, Detroit, $125 million was built a couple years ago. He voted for it, I voted against it to make sure that, and now we, we bailed them out, I voted against it, we bailed them out. Um, you know, and, and the, the corporate welfare, the crony capitalism, I am not going there, I'm going there to, I'm going there to push power out of Washington. And you know the area of education. I think it's. I think.